The Seven Generation River is made possible by funding from Vision Maker Media, with major funding provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This project is also funded in part by a grant from the Michigan Humanities Council, an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, with additional funding by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation, even Jerry Young, the Polk Family Fund, and viewers like you. Thank you. The Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan, from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future, to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. Big changes at the EPA in the Trump administration. He signed an executive order targeting more than a half dozen major regulations. The budget he unveiled yesterday would reduce its budget by a third more than any other federal agency. The Great Lakes region could see a 97% cut from 300 million down to 10 million. We live in a time of cultural turmoil. If something isn't done, the stakes are enormous because they're talking about more pollution that's going to put more pollution in the air like arsenic and mercury in in our water, and that affects the air our kids breathe and the water they drink. And deep divisions between Americans. This is what democracy looks like. I think all you have to do is turn on the news today, and you can see how terribly divisive attitudes and communication in the United States of America is today. Our environment is under threat like never before. The land, air, and water caught in the crossfire. We believe that Mother Earth is not ours. We're using it, and we have to preserve that for our next seven generations. We need to take care of her. We need to honor her. I was raised to always think about the future, think about how your decisions today are going to impact the future. Think seven generations ahead. As we rend the fabric of American culture, and with it our very environment, a small band of Native Americans nestled in the southwest corner of the Great Lakes might have the key to healing our divisions, healing nature, healing ourselves. All of these other perspectives and stories that come from this land and grow up from this land haven't been told yet, and they're important stories to be heard. This is the story of the Pokagon. We're all in creation together. Human beings don't have dominion over nature. The same type of relationships that we would want to develop and maintain and nurture with another human being are the same exact type of relationships that we want to develop and maintain with our environment. In a remote corner of the Great Lakes Basin, one small group fights to restore its world piece by piece, band by band. It is the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians. A lot of people around the world forgot what their mission was, what their purpose was, why the Creator placed them on the earth. Our specific instructions were to never forget our place, how to live with creation, because there would be a day when the rest of the world forgot that. This is Marcus Winchester, the Pokagon Band's Director of Language and Culture. He is part of a generation fighting to restore Pokagon culture. Our culture is our environment. It's a measuring stick for, for our culture and how healthy environment we are. If our environment's 
not doing good. I guarantee our culture is not doing good either. Because if our environment isn't healthy, we have nothing to pull from to keep our culture going. Every indigenous nation has its own creation story. The Pokagon Band, as part of the Potawatomi Nation, are no different. Some claim the Potawatomi have always existed here. Other creation stories tell of a prophetic migration from the eastern seaboard. While we still lived over there on the East Coast, our spiritual leaders, they started receiving prophecies, they started receiving visions, and those visions told them that we had to migrate west. And then those teachings told us that we would know we had found our new home when we found a place where the food grows on the water. So when we got to the Great Lakes area, we found manomen, wild rice, on all these waterbeds, on all the lakes and the streams. Earlier you said called this wild rice. Is, is it like really wild or did somebody actually plant it long well, is, ago or what? It's called wild rice in English. It's called minomen, or which means um, um, mino is good and men, men is seed or berry. So it's the good seed or the good berry. The wild rice or minomen fulfilled their prophecy. Minomen became a staple on Potawatomi lands that wrapped around Meshigme, the great water, or as we know it today, Lake Michigan. And that's how we'd known that we had found our, found our new home. But this wasn't just a matter of you are what you eat. Minomans symbolized their promised land, where the original people were supposed to live and nurture new generations. The wild rice made the Potawatomi one with this land. We believe that we've been in the St. Joseph River Valley for a very long time whether that's hundreds and thousands of years or whether that's since the beginning of the time. Jason Wiesaw oversees the Pokagon archives. Our relationship to this land, to the trees, the woods, the rivers of this place go very, very deep. And the health of this area is fully reflected in the health of our community. Over millennia, other gifts from the extensive wetlands were woven into the fabric of Potawatomi culture. The snapping turtle was revered as the protector of the environment. The bark from black ash trees for basket weaving. And the water itself not only for drinking, but as a habitat for fish and, of course, for growing wild rice. As time went on, we obviously cultivated and harvested our wild rice. For thousands of years, the Potawatomi culture grew from nature. This delicate balance was disrupted immediately as European settlers entered tribal lands in the late 18th century. As settlers started coming, what we find is the wild rice either went dormant on itself or it was eradicated by the settlers because it got in the way of their voyages, got in the way of their travels. So a lot of our lakes and rivers had wild rice eradicated from them here in Michigan. Then in 1830, the United States Congress passed the Indian Removal Act, which directed that all Native Americans be relocated to lands west of the Mississippi River, including the Potawatomi. The next decade brought the Trail of Tears and the beginnings of long wars for other tribes. But the Potawatomi neither fought nor acquiesced. They found a middle path. They adapted. The tribe member who charted the course was Leopold Pokagan. Obviously, he's the namesake of our tribe. He was a shrewd negotiator, very intelligent man, a visionary someone who could see the life that was ahead for our people. But I think what he really understood as a Bodewatomi person and our connection to this land, the devastating effects it could have on us if we were removed from the land, because in a way we are the land itself. 
Leopold Pokagan bought up as much of the ancestral land as possible. The tribe itself engaged local settlers who then became their allies. These tactics strengthened the tribe's hand when negotiating treaties with the federal government, treaties that guaranteed their home. Our ancestors were able to avoid removal because they decided that they didn't want to fight American expansion. They didn't want to resist American expansion, but they rather wanted to have influence over it. They decided to be proactive with it. And the way that our leaders decided to do that was by welcoming in different aspects of European American culture. In time, this small group of indigenous Americans in Southwest Michigan would refer to themselves as the Pokagan Band of the Potawatomi Indians. I think Pokagan understood that if we could maintain our connection to the land, then we could maintain a connection to our history, our ancestors, our culture, and our traditional life ways. The Pokagan adapted to the ways of white America, but assimilation comes with a cost. For the Pokagan, it meant an erosion of tradition in the old ways. Because of how we avoided removal, a lot of aspects of our culture were forgotten or put aside for one reason or another, mainly because we had to survive, our families had to survive. What took millennia to create? Pokagan culture, tribal identity, was nearly undone within the proverbial seven generations. We had to take jobs in the factories, we had to go work in the fields, we had to go do other things that prevented us from keeping different aspects of our culture alive. The Pokagan converted to Christianity, sent their children to English-speaking schools, and adopted Western ways of farming. Over time, Pokagan land was sold to European settlers, plowed up and farmed. Wetlands were drained by the straightening of the Duwajiak River. And as the wetlands dried up, the wild rice, the sacred minoman, started to disappear. Water is particularly important to the Potawatomi people because water is our lifeline. That's what our old ones tell us, that water is like the blood veins for Mother Earth. The Pokagan managed to stay together, but the concept of seven generations festered in their collective conscience. We all know growing up and we're all taught in school that most of Mother Earth is made up of water. Most of our bodies are made up of water. We know that we can't exist without water. That's why water is so significant to the Potawatomi people because we recognize how integral it is to our, our life ways. In the early 1990s, the tribal leadership began to address their future sons and daughters. In 1994, the Pokagan fought for and won federal recognition. But the Pokagan culture would never be fully restored unless their environment was healthy. They started with the Duwajiak River. You need to think of rivers as part of a cycle. Water evaporates from the oceans, uh, or the Great Lakes uh, goes up into the sky forms clouds and then eventually rains precipitation back down to the ground. That connection between where that water hits the ground and the larger water bodies, that's where rivers come into play. And so Leonardo da Vinci talked about them as capillaries and blood vessels, essentially, the circulatory system of the world. A lot of the rivers and streams have been straightened and they've been channelized. Basically, that's done in an effort to try to get all that water off of the site as quickly as possible. It disconnected that river from its floodplain. It makes it so all that water goes right into the river and jets out. Jennifer Kanine is the director of the Department of Natural Resources for the Bokagan tribe. This is how the river has been for most everyone's entire life. And they don't realize that historically this, this river used to bend and it used to wind and it used to have a, an enormous floodplain that helped to keep the river healthy. And what we're trying to do is 
actually put that river back into its historic meander bends and reconnect it to its floodplain. And by doing so, you make it a healthier ecosystem. So currently we have a straightened river with very steep banks, in some areas 10 feet tall. Grant Poole is a water quality specialist with the Bokagan DNR. Think about how that affects the wildlife in the area. Think about how that affects organisms that are used to coming out of the river or going into the river. And so our hopes is to reduce those steep banks, create a greater connection to the floodplains. The critters found in and around the, the river can more utilize the area. They're more adapted to such conditions. And so they could find these niche habitats that have been lost and use it for refuge or maybe a new food source will come back. And that's our, our ultimate hope. It'll probably take 10 to 20 years. First thing we need to do when we're doing a river restoration is do some forensic geomorphology. So we're going in and, and looking at how the river interacts with the landscape, and then also looking back at historical photographs, old maps, and survey data to try and figure out what exactly happened here and how can we set this river on a better trajectory. One of the great tools that we have now is LIDAR data, which is laser-based radar that's a shot from planes. And that can give us extremely detailed topographic data, stuff that we just can't get any other way. If we were to survey on the ground doing that, it would take you know years to collect that many data points. We do our ground survey, we do a, an assessment of the how the stream looks, what is the floodplain doing, and then we can combine that with uh, electronic data and get a really clear picture of what this river used to look like. One of the benefits of curving the Duwajiak will hopefully be the return of wild rice. That's a big effort to uh, bring that food source back to the area and all the benefits that it will provide for the people culturally, health-wise. But that's one of the most significant things about wild rice, our monomen, and those prophecies, that's how we knew we would find our new home. Over time, that rice has been lost. And one of the reasons that the rice has been lost is because a lot of those wetlands have been lost and a lot of those floodplains have been lost. Right here we have some sparse rice that's growing up. The endangered species version that's out there, which is Aquatica, um, requires a, a, a movement of water. And so that's one of the reasons why we put it in the outflow of Rogers Lake is because the water moves through there. So that would be more of a natural habitat than the pond here for the palustrous version. Hopefully one of the things that we're looking at doing with our meander project is in some of the areas where that wide floodplain will be restored, we can actually start to plant some of those wild river rice back into the area. As the project proceeds, no one is exactly sure what will happen. There are always unintended consequences, but Grant looks for inspiration in a case study just downstream from the Bokagan tribal lands. It's a small portion of the Duwajiak that has already been partially re-meandered by a local community group. This is where the river used to travel through. This is where humans dredged and, and made the channel. And what we did here is this plug sent the river back to where it was in the 1800s, its old meander. The river itself is slightly wider and a little bit shallower. You can also see the banks are not as steep. Lots of vegetation growing up right to the river's edge. Putting this meander in changes the velocity, reduces the erosion along the banks, and creates these secondary habitats and, and point bars that are important to the river. The success downstream gives the Bokagan high hopes for their portion of the Duwajiak. We have a kind of a patchwork um, of tribal properties. We're not one giant contiguous area. And so there is a lot of influence from outside sources. Two hundred years of farming has taken its toll on several bodies of water on Pokagon land, including Gage Lake, one of the Pokagon people's most cherished bodies of water. Just below the surface, surrounding the springs that feed the lake, is a ring of white algae. The algae is white because it absorbs excess nitrogen from the water. 
Nitrogen seeps into the groundwater from the fields surrounding the lake, the result of generations of fertilizer use. To preserve the health of the lake, the Pokagon are working with local farmers and residents to help them adapt to a new way of doing things. I work with several of the watershed groups in this area. Some of the things that also come out is we created an ordinance to put a 100-foot buffer around our water resources to help reduce pollutant runoff. Little by little, the Pokagon lands get healthier. But as we have seen, technology without spirituality is a dead end. So the Pokagon do what they do, they adapt. It's not a walk of endurance, it's not a walk of to see if you can prove you can do it or a race. This is Andy Jackson from the Pokagon Tribal Council. When you talk to that water and you apologize for the things that were done to it and you pray that, that it stays clean. Just as the tribe has blended the latest science into their traditional ways, it is also infusing the science with Pokagon cultural values. This is different and profound. The cleaving of the traditional and the new. From a science standpoint, we're always observing things. And from a tribal standpoint, it's always the traditional ecological knowledge, which are also observations. And so in my position, I try to combine those two things, learn the traditional knowledge and also my own experiences of what I learned through college. Understanding what Mother Nature is doing is very important. And we in the DNR try to connect to that as much as possible. I rely on communicating with the water walkers and the elders of the tribe to grasp that importance that they have with the water. You don't slush it, you don't walk fast. It just stays in that bucket and it walks with you. And it always goes forward and never goes backwards. For a culture to remain vibrant, it must change with the times. This includes adding new rituals as part of keeping the Pokake environment healthy. So for the past decade, Andy has turned the water walk into an annual ceremony. We do this to honor the grandmothers. We do this to honor the women because of the life bearers that we are. We carry that water. So we are always praying. We are always teaching. We have a song we sing, and it talks about the flow of that water and how it's quiet. Um, and how the water just flows in and flows out. And then the second verse will be stronger, and that's about the strong waves and how it comes in and how it cleanses itself and keeps, us, keeps it going for us. But why do we say boujou when I say, walk up to somebody and I say boujou? Who do I think that might be? Who is it? Yeah. Nana Buju, all right. But the Pokagon honor their timeless traditions as well. So Nana Buju, what his job was, he had to go around and tell all the things, their names. As a way to connect to ancestors from a millennia ago. I was asked to come here today to help you learn a song. And this is a welcome song. So you're going to be singing in Potawatomi. Hey, Equally important uh, hey, is then connecting those ancestors to a new generation so that seven generations from now, the Pokagon culture will remain vital. We live in turbulent times, and often, it is Mother Nature that suffers. But what the Pokagans show us is that if Mother Nature suffers, we humans suffer as well. Our people had a very, very good way of life here, and part of that is because of what the Earth provided for us and how the Earth took care of us. And that's still some of that obligation we have today is how do we as human beings find ways to develop but also to care for the earth as we develop and modernize.
In the Shnabe way of thinking, there's a big emphasis on the group, the entire people, the nation, the tribe. And so that's one of the most ultimate ways to put others before yourself is to think about those who haven't even come here yet and making sure that we try to have a good place for them when they do come here. Everything that we have to take advantage of today, we have to thank people seven generations ago because they were thinking of us. Once you begin to understand where Native people are coming from and that we're actually still here and still maintaining many of the things that our ancestors believed in, it just makes the story of this place, of this country, so much richer and so much more beautiful. The Seven Generation River is made possible by funding from Vision Maker Media, with major funding provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This project is also funded in part by a grant from the Michigan Humanities Council, an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, with additional funding by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation, even Jerry Young, the Polk Family Fund, and viewers like you, Thank you. The Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan, from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future, to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation.